Hello, my name is Michelle Chang, and I'm here representing my colleagues at CMU and Accenture to speak about patterns and opportunities for the design of human-plant interaction. Let's begin by taking a trip to the northeast Indian state of Meghalaya. This region is home to the Khasi people, an indigenous tribe that practices a unique tradition that embodies a human-nature relationship rarely seen today. For many, many generations, the Khasi people have weaved and guided the roots of the Indian rubber fig tree, also known as Ficus elastica, into living suspension bridges and ladders. This practice is a multi-generational process that takes roughly 50 years per bridge, and the results are not just stunning, but can span over hundreds of feet long and even include multiple stories. They are inherently sustainable, self-repairing, carbon negative, and structurally sound. In fact, they are more reliable in this region than materials like steel, timber, or concrete due to the frequent earthquakes, landslides, and monsoonal flooding that plague the area. Better yet, these structures also help maintain local biodiversity. A single F. elastica tree is home to hundreds of other birds, insects, and vegetation. The living root bridges of Meghalaya reflect a philosophy of being that recognizes nature as collaborators who, when engaged with thoughtfully, may aid us in producing resilient, mutualistic technologies that also bolster the mind, body, and spirit. This is in sharp contrast with many common practices today, the obvious one being our continued reliance on fossil fuels and plastics, which aside from being wasteful and harmful to the environment, are produced by systems which ignore the natural ecosystems they depend upon. This tradition of neglect also reflects a growing ideological and physical rift between the human and non-human in Western society, something that can be seen simply by examining depictions of the future in modern cinema. But what if we were to take inspiration from innovations like the root bridges of Megalea? What might the future look like if HCA researchers were to apply similarly symbiotic human nature approaches to our technologies? Could we push this further beyond living structures and towards new partnerships with the non-human, and how might such designs be successfully executed in practice? We begin this research with the belief that an understanding of the existing space of human-plant interaction within HCI may reveal patterns that not only address these questions, but subsequently reveal opportunities that might enable a more sustainable, empathetic, and climate-positive future. To that end, we define human-plant interaction as the design and use of computational technology to create interfaces that incorporate living plants as functional system components for human interaction. But why living plants? First of all, living plants are compatible with sustainability goals. They're naturally biocompatible and can sustain entire ecosystems. But forest and macroalgae are also often cited as one of the best decarbonization solutions. In fact, about 25% of global carbon emissions are captured by plant ecosystems. Living plants also have untapped design potential. They possess unique material properties, sensory systems, and behaviors we are only just beginning to understand. Living plants also retain their self-repairing and ever-changing characteristics, and like the Kasi people, maybe designers can leverage these features to create novel interactions and resilient technologies. Finally, living plants are potential conduits for nurturing interspecies empathy, a topic that we'll get more into later. The overall research contributions of our work are as follows. We provide a cross-disciplinary synthesis of HCI-relevant literature focusing specifically on plant-integrated computational prototypes and design techniques. We provide a five-theme framework for understanding and constructing HPI projects and also identify opportunities within each theme and discuss pertinent open questions and considerations for future work. As pictured here, we followed the PRISMA guidelines for conducting systematic literature reviews. All in all, we coded and analyzed a total of 71 papers across HCI and related fields, including bio and electrical engineering, art and design, and architecture and robotic control. The framework that we extracted from this analysis can be described with the following diagram and provides a structured way for understanding and formulating HPI prototypes. But don't worry about it. The, all the details for now, let's run through how each part works by walking through the framework as if you, the researcher, wants to create a plant-integrated artifact. So, as a designer interested in HPI, you probably have a goal in mind, so let's begin with the application context or design intent. We found these six to be the most common. More concretely, this can range from devices meant to provide emotional support to the elderly to designs that use live plants as materials, sensors, and living information displays. 
Finally, Interspecies' empathy-oriented projects strive to increase human awareness of non-human organisms by translating signals like plant stimuli into human comprehensible forms. Having chosen an application context, you might also have a sense for the scale at which you'd like to deploy your eventual device. We think of the most basic level as single human-plant interaction. A plant may also interact with multiple other plants of the same or different species, or with the broader ecosystem of organisms and natural phenomena in the wild. By proxy, a human who is part of this ecosystem can also interact with the broader forest network. Of these levels, plant forest interaction is by far the least explored area, likely owing to the technological difficulty of such an undertaking. A conceptual vision proposed by the Cyborg Botany Project illustrates plant forest interaction quite clearly. Here, a human communicates with another human through networked motion activation in plant interfaces. Now that you've given some thought to the general purpose and stakeholders of your HPI artifact, let's get down to some actual engineering. We think of the high-level design of HPI systems as consisting of a basic system architecture. We divided the works reviewed into four categories of system architectures. Indirect, proxy, embedded direct, and augmented direct integration. Each describes a certain way in which the plant system of the device interfaces with the outside world through a technological system. This might include non-plant sensors, hardware, or other technologies introduced by the engineer. At a high level, indirect integration refers to an engineering architecture that uses familiar HCI technologies to simulate interaction with a plant without interfacing directly with the organism itself. A good example is the pet plant, which uses the pot as the sole medium for interaction. Proxy integration, on the other hand, involves manipulating environmental factors known to affect the plant's species of interest in order to trigger a desired natural response. The Planxa project is a living matrix display composed of individual Mimosa Spegazzini pixels, which are turned on by using computer-controlled systems to blow air onto the leaves. This causes them to open and produce a dark green square on the matrix. Direct integration methods involve direct physical interfacing between the technological and plant systems. The most basic of these is embedded direct integration, which involves physically embedding macro-scale technologies within the plant membrane effectively allowing devices to access a plant's inherent biological data. The PLEASE project illustrates this through its insertion of needle electrodes within the live plant. The electrodes collect biosignals to infer meaningful information about environmental factors such as air pollution. While the actual work itself does not act upon the interpreted signals, this is a natural next step for such technology within an HCI context and why we included it in our work. Finally, artifacts that take an augmented direct integration approach harness microscale technologies like synthetic biology or nanotechnology. An example here is the nanobionic light emitting plant project, which demonstrated the feasibility of using nanoparticles to engineer watercrests that can not only emit light, but be toggled on and off via the addition of certain chemicals. Although currently the chemicals must be introduced manually in a lab, one can easily imagine an additional technology layer where the augmented plant is integrated with other computing technologies to interact more readily with the outside world. Overall, while we notice that the indirect and proxy architectures are by far the most prevalent, embedded or augmented direct integration offer a tantalizing glimpse into the future of ubiquitous computing. Such artifacts blend seamlessly with nature and are also compatible with visions of ambient or calm technology. Zooming in a bit more, each architecture configuration leverages certain plant interfacing and manipulation technologies, which couple with known plant I.O. characteristics to produce the researcher's desired effect. Interfacing and manipulation technologies reflect the toolbox of engineering knowledge employed in HPI. Broadly, this includes the five categories shown here. Future opportunities include exploring less popular techniques like material science and synthetic biology. Material science includes the use of injected materials like conductive polymers, which can functionalize plant stems into wires, material deposition for plant wearables, and nanomaterials. Synthetic biology is another high potential area as it allows researchers to directly modify organisms in novel ways and enable innovations like DNA data storage. Plant I.O. coupling reflects the space of inputs and outputs as seen from the plant system, encompassing known stimuli like environmental factors, such as moisture or light, and output responses like shape change or chemical release. 
we can think of these characteristics as something akin to APIs in software engineering. For example, the input stimuli of light can be used to manipulate a plant's outward shape or growth trajectory. Opportunities here include less explored plant output signals like chemical release, which are difficult for humans to detect without technological intervention. At this point, I'd like to briefly touch on some topics future HPI researchers might find valuable to consider. As mentioned earlier, a subset of work focuses on cultivating interspecies empathy by striving to convey a plant sense of being. Most attempts to accomplish this involve converting meaningful environmental signals into forms of information that are relatable to humans, such as translating moisture level to socially meaningful light patterns like smiley faces. But given the complex and emerging nature of the task, it does bear questioning to what extent are classically human-centered methods of translation anthropomorphizing plants as opposed to conveying their true perceptual world. Could certain methods be undermining their pro-offered motives by inadvertently communicating an artificial zoo-centric construction of plant being? And if so, what alternative approaches might help similar efforts remain true to reality? As yet, most works have yet to go beyond silicon-based sensors. It is possible that experimenting with a greater variety of technical approaches might allow researchers to gradually phase out human and machine inference about plant state and help convey information directly from the source. So we encourage researchers to ponder methods of allowing humans to tap into sensations and signals in ways that are maybe unintuitive to us, but closer to the non-human experience. We also found that authors rarely discuss the nature and implications of the human-plant relationship that they're designing for. It is already an established practice to discuss ethical and social concerns when designing interactions between humans and between humans and animals. So why not do the same for plants? Considerations here might include questions of, are you treating the plant as a material or a collaborator, a passive element or active agent? And do you plan to account for plant happiness or well-being, and how will you do so? And finally, going back to the question we asked in the beginning of this presentation, what might it look like to move beyond structural forms like the living root bridges of Megalea and create new traditions that work with plants as natural sensors, actuators, and collaborators? The frameworks proposed in this paper provide a starting point for researchers to think about how plants and emerging technologies might be leveraged in a way that align with the multi-species goals and desires of the complex systems involved in such efforts. However, they are most effective when used not in isolation, but when paired with more than human or post-humanist design theories. These are ideas like actor network theory, socialist feminist and discourse, or indigenous ecological knowledge. We would like to challenge HCI researchers to explore what artifacts might result from remixing design guides, like the one presented in this paper, with various post-humanist design frameworks. In this way, we might strive to transcend imitation or parasitism of nature and move towards respectful, longer-term partnerships with plants and other natural systems. Thank you so much for your attention, and feel free to reach out with questions or comments.